Not yet. Oh, there it is. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Wendy Sweeney, manager for Panda. Welcome to my workshop about mental wellness. Um, we will be talking about, I'm going to start talking a little bit about mental health statistics in Minnesota. And then I'm going to share a few common mental health conditions. Um, we will really be focusing on how physical and mental health are very closely related to each other. Um, and then I'm going to be going through Panda's mental health tip sheet uh, for self-care and then also share some tips on how you can use the tip sheet to help students. And lastly, we will be talking about some valuable mental health resources. Next slide. Okay. So um, I want to share some mental health statistics in Minnesota. One in five adults have been diagnosed with mental health challenges, and that's statistics from 2022. And that's actually an improvement. It used to be one in four. So that's positive. Um, but 46% of adults don't seek, seek treatment. So there's still some stigma around it. Although in Minnesota, we are sixth in the nation for lower prevalence of mental illness and higher rates of care. Next slide. So now I'm, I, um, I'm going to share some common mental health conditions. And what I'd like you to do is to pay Pay attention to the um, symptoms that are physical in nature and those that are more mental or cognitive in nature. So I'm going to start with um, depression, major depressive disorder. There are several different types of depression. And these are the symptoms that are um, common in diagnosing somebody with depression. It is that being depressed or it can be irritable and it must be lasting for at least two weeks. So everybody gets depressed and down now and then for differing reasons if you're going through a hard time, um, but usually it, it um, dissipates and uh, you can kind of pull yourself up by the bootstraps for instance. But when it's a problem is when depression is ongoing and it's people have a hard time kind of pulling out of it. And some of the other symptoms, there needs to be at least four additional symptoms to diagnose depression is um, losing interest in what you normally like to do or could also look like lack of motivation. And then there's changes sometimes in weight, eating, uh, either eating more or less Appetite has might be lessening or increasing. It kind of goes along with the weight. And then um, sleep is another change. And typically with depression, it's sleeping more than usual. So then there's less energy. It can impact concentration, which is what you may notice in the classroom or in your office offices. And then there's... Um, typically some uh, feelings of worthlessness or hopelessness, and there might be suicidal thinking going on. Next slide. The next one I wanna talk about is generalized anxiety disorder. And there, um, as with depression, there are several types of anxiety. Some could be situational, um, or um, specific, like a fear of flying or a fear of snakes, for instance. But generalized anxiety disorder is kind of an ongoing, having trouble stopping worry. And a lot of it's internal, um, where it's kind of racing thoughts and worrying about the past or something in the future um, or how you perform at work. Uh, it's just kind of an ongoing. And really what I always like to explain anxiety as um, flipping on a switch of the, what is called the survival mechanism. Most of you I'm sure have heard of that, the fight, flight, or freeze. And that is um, basically 
it, it is something we need. It's something that's built into all of our brains so that if there is actual danger uh, around us, it can help save our lives. So you kind of get into it actually just kind of um, your body is actually getting into that fight, fight, or freeze position. So tightening of muscles, pupils dilating, stomach ache, uh, headache, no appetite, break out in a sweat, heart racing, those kinds of things. And so it's similar to the survival mechanism with anxiety, <clears throat> but it's um, typically things that they're it's just uh, basically not uh, real danger, real and present danger. It's more triggered by thoughts. So some of the symptoms are that excessive worry. So I always ask clients when I'm diagnosing, are you much of a worrier? Um, and if they say, oh, yeah, I really am. I said, well, what kinds of things do you worry about? And then listening to what they might be worrying about. And I'll usually say, do you think you worry more than other people in order to say it's excessive worrying? So if they say yes. Um, and then do you have trouble controlling it? Meaning it's just kind of going in the back of your mind. Um, and then along with that, um, there would be other symptoms that might be irritability because you're more on edge the muscle tension I mentioned. So it could be tension through your, your neck and shoulders or a stomach ache, headaches. Some people have migraines, um, not being able to sleep typically with anxiety because your mind's racing or you wake up in the night with your mind racing. So then you're on edge and then you're of course worn out because you're not sleeping well. Fear is the driver. It always is, but just like if there's danger, it's fear. But 90% of what we worry about actually never happens. Next slide. Last one I wanted to, to bring up is post-traumatic stress. And I'm talking about the, these three uh, different mental health conditions because they're more, you're more likely to be, um, have students that might be suffering from depression, anxiety, or post-traumatic stress which is a type of anxiety actually. Um, but I love the a normal reaction to an abnormal event. So when um, people develop post-traumatic stress disorder, it's usually something very shocking that happens to them um, that they would not have ever expected at all. So it violates their expectations and their deeply held beliefs, kind of like a slap in the face. And it impacts all kinds of people, people who have been abused, um, whether it's physical, sexual, emotional, uh, our veterans, um, immigrants who have faced war or trauma in their lives. It can even happen with car accidents or um, tornadoes, hurricanes, when your homes are ruined, those kinds of things. But the symptoms that go along with it is the person was exposed to a dramatic event, um, or it could be somebody who witnesses somebody having something horrible happening. Um, and then what happens is it kind of gets stuck in the brain is the way I like to explain it because it kind of gets stuck in that fearful spot. And because it's so emotion driven, there, um, people a lot of times have a hard time explaining with words what happened to them, but that when it gets triggered by some re-experiencing, um, you know, like for instance, if fireworks or a car backfiring, it can be also triggered by um, sights or smells, and then that person actually is re-experiencing it re-experiencing the traumatic event in real time, it seems real to them. Um, and so therefore they're going to avoid, avoid places that would remind them of having, or that they might be fearful of re-experiencing, like getting out in crowds or going to the fireworks display, um, those kinds of things. And then lastly, next bullet, so then they're on edge. They're kind of hyper vigilant. They are so uptight and fearful. They're looking 
constantly for any danger around them. So like a student would uh, most likely sit with their back to a wall where they can see the windows and doors so they can be on the lookout. And I think there's one more bullet there. So then they, um, the last thing is having some negative thoughts about their self or others or the world. They know it's, they think of a, it's a dangerous place. It's not safe. We're not safe here. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this is where I, when I developed this mental health, health tip sheet, which we're going to be going through next, um, I just, I'm much more proactive rather than reactive in my thinking around it because most of us uh, know ad nauseum about how to stay physically healthy, right? We all know about how to eat in moderation, to eat healthy, to exercise, but not many people are very aware of how, well, what do I do to stay mentally healthy? And they are, they are so closely intertwined, those two, and sometimes it's not connected that way. So I wanna start with um, whoever's uh, comfortable putting in the chat box, what physical symptoms did you notice as I was going through those three conditions? So let's start with physical, and then we'll follow up with the mental or cognitive. Sleeping more, yes, physical. Gail, any others? Loss of appetite, yes. Body aches, pains, good. Apathy, yes. Okay, anyone else? So let's, uh, those are all great. So you know what happens is because physical symptoms are, um, physical symptoms are more uh, noticeable and uncomfortable that the first thing a lot of my clients do is they go to the doctor first, which is not a bad idea, but you know, to make sure there's not a, a physical symptom going on. But if you can't sleep, for instance, I need a sleep med um, or I'm in pain. I'm, you know, going to go to the chiropractor. Um, so there's sometimes there's just a disconnect because the physical is the uncomfortable. So let's talk about what are some of the mental or cognitive symptoms. Please share any that you noticed when I was talking about the conditions. Feeling worthless, yes, good. Avoidance, brain fog. Any others? Okay, so the point I'm trying to make is physical and mental health are closely related, that oftentimes it, uh, the physical symptoms go along with the cognitive symptoms, but it's a little harder to identify because unless you're paying attention to it, a lot of it's pretty unconscious. So let's go on to the next slide and I'll start talking about these, this mental health tip sheet. So this is on our website, there are 10, simple, simple things that you can learn for yourselves. Some of the, them are things you probably know. Um, and <clears throat> they um, are just uh, things like you could also talk to students about if you're in the classroom or if you're testing with them and there's a couple things you can help them with. Um, so again, I'll just gonna, gonna briefly talk about each one of these and um, we'll go from there. So the first tip number one, talk about your feelings. Better out than in. When you stuff your feelings, 
And when you're uh, uh, in the helping profession, a lot of times you're helping other people and you're not talking about your own feelings. So it is really important not to stuff them down because then it, they end up coming out sideways, whether through an ang angry outburst, because you can only stuff them for so long. Um, and we've all, that's all happened to all of us, I'm sure, where you've said something you regret out of anger, um, but it can come out as anger or um, can be uh, kind of people sometimes will drink as a result or try to escape those even talking about feelings, especially if you didn't grow up where that was acceptable. Um, so talking about feelings is really important. And a way you can do that is first finding somebody you trust to talk about what's going on in your life uh, or uh, whether that's a spouse or partner or coworker or relative, sibling or parent, um, but being able to talk about them. Um, easily and you know we all need a time time to vent and I think that's actually healthy it's a healthy thing rather than I think sometimes our culture says you shouldn't talk about some of these things um, and if you don't have a safe person to talk to then journal just writing I'm, I think words on paper are so powerful um, so it doesn't even have to be you know like a long journal it can be a short you know just expressing these feelings Two, number two build your support network this i'm sure you are aware of i think um you know sometimes i will be the first to admit i am not very good about re initiating gatherings when people reach out to me i'm all in but i'm not as good about reaching out to others and it is really important to keep those connections and I think with our um, students, sometimes school is their support network and really kind of recognizing that some people don't have a lot of support, whether they have dysfunctional families or they live far away from their families. And we know our um, students, our ESL students also lack a lot of support. So being aware of connecting with them, whether that's encouraging, peer support um, in the classroom, having pair work um, and sharing uh, is a way to help build that community in your classroom. Tip number three is setting boundaries. I think this is very difficult for those in the helping profession, as you're, you all are. Um, it, just saying no it is sometimes you, you knee jerk yes to invitations at when you really, and then you think later, oh, shoot, I should have said, no, I really don't wanna go. And then it's much harder to get out of an obligation. Also in a workplace, if, oh, well, you take this extra project on and you're already so busy and you say yes, and then it's like, oh, I, I don't really have time for this. So I always um, use the tip for setting boundaries when it's difficult for you to give yourself some time to really think about, do I want to do this or not? Um, so it can be, let me check my, my schedule and get back to you. I, I need to check in with my spouse and let you know if that'll work or whatever. You're just coming up with that phrase that you just use over and over and over. And then, and don't feel bad about it. And you don't always have to tell a reason either. Um, that's something I always have to emphasize. You don't have to give a reason why you can't go. It's just not going to work out for me. I, you know, whatever it is. Number four, I'm sure you all know about this taking a break. Um, this is important for students too, um, whether it's a lot of, um, a lot of uh, teachers I know do like five minute yoga or play some calming music or um, doing a brain break. Those are all things that you can do aside from like, let's take a full break and then everybody leaves the room and it's, sometimes it's hard to get them back. But for yourselves in the workplace, it's also important to take those breaks, getting up and walking around, going outside if you can, just taking those breaks is really important for all of us. Tip number five is quieting your mind. 
I feel like we are in a society where we are constantly barraged by information. We all are walking around with cell phones. They're basically little computers where you can be reached all the time. I grew up in a time where you didn't have phones and you didn't have texting. I mean, you had phones, but they were connected to your wall. So you would have to come home and find out who called you. You weren't able to be reached at work unless they called you on a phone line. Um, now you just, you, you can watch TV 24 seven. You can have uh, social media, texting, email. So it's not healthy mentally for that. I really um, want you to think about, you know, reducing social media, turning it off, turning your cell phone off for an hour or two a day um, are ways of quieting your mind. Um, and then the other, you know, about meditation, deep breathing is something that you can uh, easily teach students to do, take some deep breaths and um, the 624 is the one that I always recommend, but there's a million of them out there. So breathing in for a count of six, hold for two, out for four, and doing that five times is a simple way of doing it. Okay, next slide. Um, so number six is keeping a gratitude journal. And all I mean about that for yourselves is to think about um, two to three things that you are grateful for or that are positive that happened in your day. And the reason I like this is that um, we are, like I said before, we have that 24 seven input and a lot of it can be very negative. Um, and so sometimes we forget about what's going well in our lives. And so just thinking about like, oh, somebody complimented what I was wearing. That was a good thing. Or I accomplished something at work or it's a beautiful day. Looking, it can be anything. And um, so with students that can also be, you know, just even reminding them of something they've done well. Um, I know some teachers have used this tip to, um, to, uh, have students journal about being thankful. What are you thankful for? It's a good writing exercise, that kind of thing. Number six, this is an, an, a, one of my favorite ones. And, and if any of you have seen me before, I talk about this one a lot, um, putting your focus on what you can control. So much energy can go into those things that we can't control. They're completely out of our control. Um, and if you can um, pay attention to what you can control versus what you can't, that is a very healthy thing. So Heather, would you just go to click to the next slide for a sec? Because I do have an example. So for instance here, so this is what I recommend is writing it down again, what, what, so that you can separate it. Cause a lot of times they get muddled, right? So if it's a situation, like for instance, if it's a situation where you're having a conflict with somebody else and we all, this happens to everybody, including students, it's just a simple, well, what can I control in this situation? And what can't I control? So what you can control, what I say, how I react, feel, think, what I decide to do or not, if I like someone or not. But you can control what other people say or how they react or how they feel or what they think um, or do, or if they like you or not. I mean, you don't have any control over that. So putting your energy into what you can do and trying to release what you can't. Okay, now go back, Heather. Um, number eight is writing down worries. Um, this is just a very simple thing, kind of a journaling um, exercise of trying to stop. If you're a warrior at all, then trying to stop using stop, thought, stoppage. Um, like stop, stop, stop. I'm going to do that before or when I get home, before I go to bed. Um, this has been proven to be really helpful with sleep if uh, where you just time it 10 minute tops, like what am I worried about? 
or what's been bugging me today is that uh, can be really helpful. Um, with students, a tip for this is that is um, proven in research too, is if they have test anxiety, they can, um, to have them write down their worries or talk about their worries before they take the test. And that's been proven to improve performance. Okay, number nine, challenging your thoughts. Um, this is when I talk about how we have this internal dialogue. We all have internal dialogues going on all the time. And <clears throat> oftentimes we tell our things that just are simply not true. Uh, whether it's through messaging you got growing up, whether it was direct or indirect, uh, where we kind of, uh, oftentimes most people are pretty hard on themselves. And you think the thoughts you have about yourself, you would never say to anybody else. Um, so this is another exercise that I use with my clients. So I wanted to recommend it in the tip sheet. It's not complicated. So Heather, go to more slides out for me. And I'll show an example of that. So how I, um, how I present this is putting your thoughts on trial. So you're an attorney now. And let's, we need to see how much proof that you have that this thought is true. So what a real common one is I'm not good enough. Uh, okay, well, well, what what proof do you have that this is true? And oftentimes the proof that it is true is what keeps that negative thought in motion. So for instance, oh, my parents expected me to be perfect. They didn't tolerate mistakes. I have made a lot of mistakes and I've failed some tests if it's related to a student. Uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, but then the next step is then, well, what proof could it possibly, maybe this statement is false. Okay, well, I have a career, I have friends who like me, I'm appreciated at work, I've successfully raised children, I've passed many tests and gotten good grades. So then typically what I do with clients, and you can do this for yourself or with students, is if the longer one is false, then that is the proof in the trial that that's a false statement. Last step is then coming up with a new or truthful statement. Uh, <clears throat> so I just gave an example of I've accomplished a lot and I'm a good person doing the best I can. But Heather, go back. Thank you. Last one is reducing toxic relationships. Um, and this is something, I mean, we can't choose our relatives. Um, but you can put energy in the people that you feel supported. Um, uh, this is true also for friends. You can choose your friends. And so if you're in a relationship where someone is draining your energy, that's a really big red flag that this is not healthy. It's just not healthy. And you don't have to continue to be friends with somebody who pulls you down, who talks constantly and doesn't ask you questions, for instance, or who continues to do the same mistakes over and over, but doesn't do anything to change. Those can be really draining. Um, so considering limiting time with those toxic people, and if it's a relative, making sure you, Thanksgiving's coming up, making sure you go next to somebody in the family that raises you up. Uh, you could still be polite to people, but you don't have to force yourself to talk. Uh, to others that might drain your energy. Okay, go to the next slide. Well, go out three slides. Here we go. Okay, so that's the mental health tip sheet. Um, and I want to encourage you to use these tip sheets for yourself and for students. What we did at Crystal Learning Center or Panda is House is we made a big poster of the mental health tip sheet and put it outside um, in the hall. And, and we have also put out um, the tip sheet in handouts that students can take and we have it available in several different languages. Um, but you also need to know about some very important mental health resources. And there was a handout that I think went into the uh, I'm not sure if it did. I I know I 
posted it, but I will show you where one is on our website too. But the two that I really want to point out is there's a fairly new suicide crisis li lifeline. Um, it used to be a long phone number, a 1-800 number. And uh, about a year ago, it became a national law that 988, kind of like 911, um, is how anyone can call if anyone's having suicidal thinking or if they're in a crisis. And they have um, translators in 150 languages. Um, people can text, they can call, they can go online and chat. Um, so it's very, very easy to access. And I've, apparently I've heard that the, a lot of um, the calls have increased tremendously since they went to 988. So that's a very positive thing. Second thing I want to point out is what's called mental health crisis response teams. A lot of people are not aware of this, um, but there are crisis response teams in every county in Minnesota. And you just have to find the number, which is on our website. I'm gonna show you that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> and they will send out, you can call them if yourself, someone in your family, a student is having a mental crisis and you don't wanna call 911, never you know, hesitate to call 911. But this is another option. They will come to the school, they will come to a person's home, they will go to their workplace and they'll do an evaluation on the individual and, and then make sure that they get to a safe place. Okay, next. Okay, so here's our website. Um, for those of you who are new, I would really encourage you to check out our website. We have so many wonderful tools on here and re community resources, uh, strategies for the classroom. Um, Okay, so this might be a little hard. Heather's had to help me out because my computer has been working very slowly today. So Heather, can you, if you click on the purple panda at the top there, it should, no, very top, up. Yeah, nope, back. Uh, nope. <laughs> well, why don't you click on that? Should link me, should link us to the website okay so heather if you wouldn't mind like so if you go down the right side all the green bars go down to mental health so you want to go to the mental health chap chapter and then here you'll see all the different if you want more information about mental health this is a place to go but i wanted to point out where the mental health tip sheets are so click on that And then you can print the ones that I showed you. It were in English, obviously, but you can see all the different languages we have. When we put these out in every language, the students were so excited to see their native language in print. Uh, so a lot of them took them. So um, I think this is, uh, you know, you have to be careful, some cultures, uh, but the, we're talking about being healthy, right? Okay, now go back, just back page. Oh, good. Now I want to go to the resources link and, and show you. So under the resources link, this is where you can find gobs of low cost or free resources. So I have the 24 hour free things at the top of the page. There's a mental health crisis response where it says click here. You can find the number of your county there. Um, and continue down, Heather. A little further. Now here, underneath, oops, up a little bit. Underneath, there's a, um, underneath the crisis line, um, that's where you can print up a list of resources. So there's a ton in here. You don't need to print this all out. That's too much. So there is one that is, that you could hang in your room or have available or kind of on a bulletin board. And you can also access the mental to sheet there too. Um, the rest of them are low cost, <clears throat> meaning they're usually sliding fee. Some are free. I have 
um, metro area and greater Minnesota resources in there. So just wanting to make you aware of that. How are we doing on time, Gail? You've got about five more minutes. Okay. Okay, so you can click out of uh, Panda and then go to the next page. And now I would like you all to share a mental health tip that you will use for yourself. Of the ones that I mentioned, <clears throat> or even one that you do already, please share that in the chat box. Deep breathing and walking outside. Great, Julie. Play softball to decompress and get away. Great. Both are good. And be with other people. The 624 breathing. Meditation. Negative I also, on trial. I also saw journaling and do a morning workout before these started coming in too. Great. Love it. Reading, going for a walk. Okay, Heather, do you see any others? Revisit boundaries, write out concerns, worries, evaluate locus of control. Great. Love it. Good. Nice uh, meditation, too. Great. All right. All of those are wonderful. All right. Well, um, I want to thank you all. Oops. Okay. Oh, I didn't catch that. Yoga time. Okay, I'm looking at them now. I find myself in a upcoming event. I try to find the most reasonable, worst case scenario. Usually it's less bad than I think. I find identifying it helps. Yeah, sometimes you can think like, well, what's the worst thing that could happen? And then that knowing that you could get through that anyway. Okay, any more? Okay, everybody, thank you so much for participating. Um, if you have any other questions or wanna reach out, feel free to contact me uh, at panda at ardell.org. Go to our website if you need any more resources, if you want to print up the mental health tip sheets for your program, I would encourage you to do so. So I appreciate your time and enjoy the rest of the conference.